there is a continuum between temporary visa workers and labour trafficking in this country. It's why we are so strongly vocal on the issue of temporary workers. They throw it back at us, they tell us we are racist, we're xenophobic, we're protectionist, we're anti-business, but the reality is that these workers are too easy to exploit and many of their pay and conditions are virtually indistinguishable from slavery. Migrant workers are more vulnerable to exploitation for so many reasons. Language, uh, limited language skills, limited understanding of their rights, limited social networks, uh, limited access to unions. Exploitation of migrant workers occurs in the same context where modern slavery occurs. Victims of modern slavery are not a distinct group that only anti-slavery organisations encounter. Our perception is often that they are trafficked sex workers or domestic servants. They are agricultural workers. They are people stuck in a terrible... Uh, I don't know if you've, you've taken any notice recently of the shipping industry and the tuna industry where workers are pretty much press-ganged. Do you know that term? Press-ganged press and, and stuck on ships to work for months and months on end. It's really more appropriate to consider the issue as an experience of victimisation that can affect anyone who is vulnerable, including temporary skilled migrants, international students, working holiday makers and even Australian citizens. Simply providing information once to a temporary overseas worker before they start working won't address vulnerability that they are, that they are bound to experience and it won't stop them thinking about the risks before they come. The low number of identified victims of trafficking in Australia is a direct result of insufficient screening processes and unaddressed barriers to seeking help experienced by the exploited, the trafficked and the enslaved people themselves. We need to counterbalance the power of unscrupulous employers, the power that they have over vulnerable workers and we need to create incentives for reporting workplace violations. Workers need to feel safe to speak up. They need to be linked with unions. Doing so will improve not only the rate of identification of fraud and exploitation, but also that of human trafficking. As trade unionists, we want protections for all workers, regardless of their immigration status, and really regardless of whether or not they are union members. We want improved accountability for the labour hire industry, which is often the main culprit in exploitation and trafficking where they bring workers in in gangs, they place them in these terrible, vulnerable situations, they are exploited, they are sent home. And then if the authorities find these labour hire people, they just fall in, they hide, they disappear, and they pop up again. I'll never forget one of the <clears throat> years ago, Meredith will remember this, when I came to WA and there was a big dispute at a building site here in Perth. And I got asked by the CFMEU if I would join them and go down to the picket line. And the issue was that, Meredith, do you remember there was about, about 15 um, migrant workers, maybe more, who hadn't been paid, they'd worked on this work site, on this construction site, they hadn't been paid for nearly, what, eight weeks, 18 weeks, a long time, months. They hadn't been paid at all. And we were down there, the CFMEU, and, and picketing to make sure, to try to get some attention to the fact that these workers hadn't been paid. And the, the guy came down, the project manager comes down in his suit and his tie and and um, Joe McDonald says to me, I knew you being here with your pearls on would get him out, Jed. <laughs> Down he comes and he comes out to talk to me and I said, you know, why aren't these people being paid? And he said, it's not my fault. I haven't been invoiced for their wages. <laughs> I kid you not. I said, well, who employed them? He said, I don't know. He had no idea who was supplying the labour to his construction site and his project. But as far as he was concerned, he didn't supply the labour and it was not his uh, problem to make sure they were paid. One of my big hobby horses at the moment is to get rid of that horrible term human capital. Have you ever heard of that? I hate it. I hate it because it just makes human beings another part of the capital chain. You're just a dollar or a coin. Global supply chains have become a common way of organising investment, production and trade in the global economy. In many countries, particularly developing countries, they've created employment and opportunities for economic and social development. There's no denying that. They have created jobs in some countries that otherwise would not have industry. However, 
There's masses of evidence to show that the dynamics of production and employment relations within those glo that global economy, including supply chains, have dreadful negative implications for workers. In some extreme cases, they resort to forced and child labour. And in turn, such practices create unfair competition for suppliers who do comply with labour regulations and international labour standards. My poor kids were all out for dinner the other night and they're all on their phones and I looked at their phones and I said, oh, you have to get rid of your Samsung phones now. <laughs> they all said, what? Why? And I tell them the big long story about Samsung and they all look at each other and go, oh, mum, you know, there's not going to be anything left to buy. That is the way of it. If we don't start putting pressure back on these companies and they start creating things that we can buy, we're never going to turn practices around. Because the scope of labour legislation, regulation and jurisdiction is at a national level or state level, cross-border sourcing of goods and services create difficulties in achieving those workplace compliance. We all know that. Globally, the only people really globally in the world who are putting a great deal of pressure on trying to get standards across borders, I'm proud to say, are our global unions. The Samsung workers have been really, really brave and they've really come out and spoken up about the terrible working conditions because basically the Samsung workers are dying from poisoning from the products that they are using to make the phones. And they have actually now proven that they are dying from these terrible diseases that they're getting from these poisons. I'm not sure exactly where the poisons are in the global supply chain, but Samsung is washing all hands of responsibility for this. And it's really, they are being incredibly ruthless about it. And the ITUC has taken this on. They're really gonna blow, try to blow Samsung up. If you join a union in the Samsung supply chain, you get what they you call the term contract guillotine. So any of the supply chain organisations that have union members get cut out of the supply chain. So all of these pressures felt by workers around the globe are often worse, and I just want to quickly touch on this before I finish. Um, they are far worse for women, and sadly for girls. So not only must they contend with low wages, exploitative conditions and life-threatening work environments, they also face the added threat of domestic workplace and sexual violence. Recently I was speaking to some women workers um, from Nigeria. I was lucky enough to be in Geneva a couple of weeks ago at an ILO conference, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And uh, they were telling me about a study that they have pulled together and brought from Nigeria that observes that women who work outside the home and therefore cannot carry out household responsibilities to the level that's expected of their male partner are increasingly being subjected to intimate partner violence. So not only do they face the problems of sexual harassment and gender-based uh, discrimination or violence in the workplace, but because they have to go out to work and aren't fulfilling their duties at home, they get it at home as well. And just as a little aside, and I know, you know, but I, I just am very proud of this, so I want to tell you. Uh, when I was in Geneva just last week, we went along to talk about uh, gender-based violence. No, no, it wasn't. It was just violence in the workplace against men and women. And the ILO does not have a standard about this, which is surprising. A nurse, someone who was constantly being hit, beaten, had my hair torn, being strangled as a nurse in an ED department or on a ward, uh, third party violence is pretty much a workplace issue that I think the employers have a responsibility for. Well, when we got there, we were told, listen to the workers group. We're all sitting around like this talking about our strategy and our plan and how we're going to get this great um, document up. And we were told the employers just aren't going to wear it. They've told us it's no third party violence, no domestic violence. Sorry, you know, it's not worth the fight this time. Let's save it for another day. The basic implication was, you know, it's all right for you guys in a first world country who can bargain about these things, but, right? Well, I saw red. Anyway, I won't bore you with the details, but we got fantastic clauses on third party violence and domestic violence leave and provisions for women in an ILO <laughs> standard. Thank you. <laughs> because we are the trade union movement and the trade union movement never gives up. Ever. You've got to start by thinking big, that we are going to take this on and we are going to win. And we will, no matter if it's on a global scale, on a national scale, on a state scale, on a workplace scale, or in someone's home. We will fight for justice. And we will do it to the best of our ability and to the best of our resources. 
And so that's why, again, I congratulate you for pulling this group together. Please think big. Please think that we can do it. And don't be disheartened because we're taking a long time to get there. We will get there. I know it. So thank you.